Recently, on a typically sultry August morning, New Orleanians awoke to a surprise. Amid the shops and hotels, the restaurant and the casinos of the fabled Riverfront District, a visitor as unexpected as a space alien suddenly appeared. Somehow, a fully functional flying World War II B-25 bomber was found sitting stoically just outside the Riverwalk Marketplace and the Hilton Hotel on the Canal Street Wharf. A promotional gimmick? A lure for shoppers? A new permanent fixture? None of the above. No, by the end of its week-long visit, this bomber, known as Panchito, would more accurately be seen as a symbol. A symbol of the American spirit of fighting back when the odds are at their longest. Something New Orleanians have had to learn much about since Katrina came calling in 2005. In a very real sense, this iconic old airplane, which gave hope and inspiration to a discouraged nation in one of its darkest hours, became the centerpiece for a very American celebration in an iconic American city that knows something about how to celebrate. But who saw the connection between the hallowed history of this old warrior and the challenges facing New Orleans? And how on earth did they deliver Panchito's payload of hope right downtown? The answers will very likely surprise you. In 2002, the National Executive Committee of the Disabled American Veterans, the nation's oldest and largest veterans advocacy organization, designated New Orleans to host its 86th National Convention five years hence. But in August of 2005, an event occurred which would forever link New Orleans to one of the most devastating tragedies 
in American history. We don't hear all that much about Katrina anymore. In New Orleans, they call the disappearance of the aftermath from the news Katrina fatigue. But estimates are that as much as half of the population of the city has yet to return. I thought we'd get to see forever. I'm David Schillingkamp, and uh, I'm from New Orleans, a native of New Orleans, and one side of my family from France has been here since the 1780s. Um, most of my lineage, about three quarters of it, is German. Uh, I am in the shipping business. We're in the customs house brokerage and freight forwarding business, and in the barge logistics business. I'm president of our company, MBLX, and uh, the, the city and uh, shipping surrounding it uh, has been a part of my life uh, ever since I got out of the Army JAG Corps uh, as a lawyer uh, in 1975. My name is Jerome Alexander. I'm a lifelong resident of New Orleans. I say red beans and rice and gumbo bread. <laughs> I said my DNA uh, reared in the, uh, I guess we started off on the West Bank, which some people say is the best bank. Uh, East Bank, most of my life, um, attended uh, New Orleans schools, uh, primarily Catholic. Uh, worked in the counseling profession most of my adult life. Uh, currently, I'm working with Total Community Action Incorporated, uh, one of the agencies in the city that uh, is on the forefront of helping people put their lives back together. Our program is called Families Matter, and uh, we believe that the heart of the crisis right now is reuniting families and being supportive to families in crisis, and uh, that's what I'm about right now. Hi, my name's Tom. My call sign's Trigger. I'm a retired Navy man, and what I do now is give tours of the beautiful French Quarter with my pal here, Katie, nine-year-old mule. Same thing here on the right, housing the Clover Grill, eggs and grits 24 hours a day. Cheeseburgers cooked under a 65 Cadillac hubcap to seal in all those good fat juices. Thank you, thank you. You know, at the early hours after the storm, the storm really didn't hit the city. 
broadside. It really struck the Mississippi Gulf Coast. And we thought we had really been spared the major part of it. But what happened was the storm surge flooded the eastern part of the city. But the central part of the city and the part of the city that everyone saw most of on CNN was flooded not by the storm surge directly, but by the rising waters in the lake, which back flooded the drainage canals and caused breaches in those canals, relatively small breaches. The canals shouldn't have failed, but they did. Those breaches flooded the main part of the city, uh, let's say about 70% of the city. Wow, and, and I know you know all the locations where this happened. It's like I said, you were here. You, you're, you know, it's always good, to, instead of get it from a news reporter, it's always good to get it from somebody who's really from here, because you know the story. We're looking at Lake Pontchartrain, which is 75 miles east-west, 25 miles north-south. To the east, it leads to the sea. And during Hurricane Katrina, storm surge preceded the storm, that is the rising tide, forced itself into the lake and created a surge of water that inundated the canal, which was supposed to be for drainage of rainwater, and created pressures which burst the levees and created the major flood of waters which hitched the main part of the city. And we're looking at pilings that formerly um, supported restaurants and bars and other establishments here. This is called West End. Uh, West End, and uh, you can see they're all gone and uh, destroyed by the hurricane. They're not back yet. We're looking down the 17th Street Canal to the south. 17th Street Canal, again, is one of the major drainage canals that drains rainwater from the city of New Orleans out. And this area where you see the new concrete is the major breach that caused flooding in the city of New Orleans. And that portion of the levee of the wall gave way um, around 10, 11 o'clock in the morning and caused the seawater, in essence, to enter the city of New Orleans. You can see they've replaced and reinforced that area. And right now, uh, there's a barge with rocks that's uh, reinforcing the footing of the levee. We're standing in Lakeview in New Orleans, and we are right near the base of the portion of the 17th Street Canal levee which gave way during Hurricane Katrina. Behind me is a house that has been totally not touched or rebuilt since the storm. But if we walk over this way in the direction of the canal, we're gonna see one house on the right and three houses on the left side of the street. These houses have been completely rebuilt. And uh, it's obvious that those owners, those residents, don't think that that levee canal is gonna be breached again. We're looking at the code placed on the buildings searched in the wake of the hurricane. Uh, that standard code with an X, the top was the date. On the left hand side is the unit that did the inspection. The date was 929. The unit was NPD, New Orleans Police Department. They found no bodies, no casualties. Every house in this area and many houses that were greatly flooded were all searched and marked and coded in such a manner. I don't know, it's like the uh the Katrina story is hard to begin and it's hard to end. Uh, it's kind of still going on. Uh, 
so many people who were here before and not here. Um, I, I guess I could say it's just a, a total change of reality. Like most New Orleanians, we figured we'd be gone for a couple of days and we had heard about uh, various storms in the past and you know we planned on coming back so there was this ritual of what am I gonna bring that's gonna last for a couple of days you know what what should we bring food wise or clothes uh, put stuff high up in the room just in case the water comes up to bed level that kind of thing it was just weird of course the uh, not being able to find lodging and uh, long lines at the restrooms along the way and uh, not knowing where to evacuate to and well, I ended up going to uh, Cousins in uh, Arkansas, state of Arkansas, Malvern, a little small town. Uh, I stayed about a week with my girls until my wife was able to uh, reunite with us and then we ended up going to Houston. Uh, five months later, close to six months later, we returned. And New Orleans is a very interesting town. It was like uh, living in a scene of the, of the Outer Limits, one of my old favorite black and white shows when I was a kid. It's, it's hard to explain, but if you can imagine, absolutely no sound. No birds, no dogs barking, no cars, no machinery running, no sound at all. Dead silence. Everything gray from the waters that came through. They left a gray covering on buildings, on trees, on leaves. Everything was a uniform gray throughout. Even the sky was gray, it was very eerie. We had soldiers from all over America, all over here. My neighborhood was being guarded by the 82nd Airborne. We had the 101st in here as well. Down further in the coast where it was the most badly hit, where they had 25 feet of water over their houses, everything was gone. Entire cities, Port Sulphur and Venice, were totally eliminated. Nothing but cement concrete steps going up to nothing where houses used to be. Uh, large boats, the largest of fishing boats, sitting in the middle of fields miles uh, from water where they'd been left after the waters receded. But each night I'd come home to a, a quiet house. Family was still miles away. 82nd Airborne was still in the neighborhood and they told me not to come out at night because they were not firing warning shots anymore. It was getting pretty violent. I walked around with my nine millimeter in my trousers and a shotgun in the car and another shotgun near my bed. And it was like the wild west then. I didn't go anywhere without my, my weapons and, uh, and my retired military ID. And it was that way for months. And over a, a brief period of time, more and more relief started in. Everybody from the American Red Cross to many church groups and Habitat would all move in. You know, throughout the storm, the locals could have never recovered on their own. We, we depended an awful lot on people from all over the country and the world to help us. And first and foremost among any were the soldiers, the sailors, the airmen, the Marines, the Coast Guardsmen uh, were the ones that came here during the storm to save us and bail us out and after the storm to rebuild us. Our initial hospitals, our initial service centers, our law enforcement were all military. And that extends to our former military, such as the disabled American vets. I myself am a disabled American vet, proud to have served my years in the service. And I was proud to see the disabled vets come down here and uh, have their convention here, bring a B-25 down here in remembrance of the Doolittle Raid. And they could have easily, like so many other corporations did, cancel their time in New Orleans and take that business away from us that we desperately need. And they could have went to any other city had they chosen to, but they stuck with New Orleans because they understand what it is to try and recover from something that tears your heart out. And I can't tell you how many disabled American vets I've met since the storm that are down here on their own or with church groups or with the Red Cross, with Habitat for Humanity or other groups helping us rebuild all on their own time and all just out of their heart and we thank them for that. Ha 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 ha, May.
I was assigned at uh, Utapau, Thailand, the B-52 bomber base. I worked in the, in the hospital. And uh, working in the hospital unit, um, you know, everyone is a medic. And um, you see a lot of death. Before I went in the military, I had already smoked my first joint. I have to say that. I had already drank my first beer. But I have to say that because of my experiences there, I began to rely heavily on those particular things to relieve the anxiety and the fear uh, that I felt. Uh, there were many times when um, I tried to be a Christian. I tried um, drug rehab many times through the VA. But it, it didn't hold a reality for me because I, the things that bothered me were just too far deep down on the inside. Want to be a Christian in my heart. In my heart. And <laughs> we have sang together all our lives uh, at home, in church, uh, in groups, and then just he and I doing the, the duets, the, the things together. But we have sang together all of our lives, and I think one of the reasons that he is here is because of the, the connection that he and I have in reference to singing. My brother uh, has had a very difficult journey, and uh, he and I, we have, uh, you know, being brothers, aside from being brothers, we still have had a connection, uh, period. Lord, I want to be I used to sing because it was something to do, it was uh, how I made money. Uh, when I sing now, I sing out of gratitude to my God. I sing because He gave that to me, for me to give back to Him. And it's how I can tell someone about my pain, about my suffering, but I can also tell them about my joy and my peace, about how much God loves me. And it's renewed every day. Lord, Lord I want to be a Christian. Though the first flight of a B-25 was in 1940, in a way, Panchito's trip to New Orleans actually began shortly after World War I. The DAV was founded in the wake of World War I. More than 4.7 million Americans served in that war. 53 and a half thousand were lost in combat. Accidents and illness killed another 63,000. More than 200,000 soldiers were wounded. Within months of returning home, Half of the four million servicemen were released from the military. Within a year, four million Americans were jobless and broke. Recession and unemployment crippled the economy. America was as ill-prepared to deal with the aftermath of a world war as it initially was to fight one. Disabled veterans caught in this environment knew they only had one hope, to turn to each other. 
In 1920, they formed the Disabled American Veterans of the World War. For 88 years, through World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, Iraqi Freedom, and every other circumstance which has put American service men and women in harm's way, the DAV has continually served those who have borne the wounds and scars of our defense. Among the ways the DAV connects with veterans in need is through its air show outreach program. The organization attends over 20 of the largest air shows in the country every year, and it does not show up empty-handed. To make sure it contributes content to every show it attends, the DAV contracts with two beautifully restored B-25s, which form the centerpiece of its display. The airplanes are a huge draw. Recently, a reunion of Mitchell B-25 bombers took place near Detroit. Over 60 years after the end of World War II, these aircraft are still revered, largely for the role they played in one of the most gallant operations in U.S. military history, the immortal Doolittle Raid. As it turned out, the New Orleans DAV convention would also be the 65th anniversary of the Doolittle Raid, and that sparked an idea with Gary Weaver, DAV's National Communications Director. Wouldn't it be a neat idea if we could ever bring a plane, that particularly a B-25, to one of our conventions as a showcase for the DAV and for our members and guests to show this plane off? Well, it was not practical in so many cities because you would have to transport it perhaps through a city or on highways and that might entail taking the wings off. So that was kind of impractical. But when we thought about New Orleans, it was like a light bulb kind of went on and it's a port city. But it was a great concept, but could we really make it happen? Larry and Lori Kelly own, maintain, and fly the B-25 bomber that the DAV is going to bring to downtown New Orleans. It is named Panchito after a B-25 which fought in the Pacific Theater during World War II. This particular airframe was built in October of 1944 and went online to train bomber crews. It remained on active Air Force duty from then until 1958. After being sold in 1962, it was a fire bomber, a chemical tanker, and a static museum piece. Ten years were spent restoring it to flying status. The Kellys purchased it in September of 1997. I'm extremely honored to be you know, asked to take the airplane down to New Orleans. You know, when they first asked me, I said, absolutely, positively, we want to do that. Uh, you know, the airplanes are the tools. You know, you can't build a house without good tools. You can't win a war without good tools. The airplanes is what the veterans use as their tools to win the war. Singer-songwriter Aaron Tippin of Nashville certainly agrees. He's a longtime supporter of veterans' causes. His first tour to entertain the troops overseas was Bob Hope's last during the 1991 Persian Gulf War. He has returned to the Mideast every year since. The DAV B-25 project caught his attention for other reasons as well. He's a highly qualified pilot who once earned a living as a corporate pilot before getting a break in the music business.
In addition, he's an FAA certified airframe and power plant mechanic. As it turned out, that was a credential which would serve him well in New Orleans. And he has a special commitment to the victims of Katrina. After the tragedy, Tippin was the first singer to contact the Bush Clinton Katrina Fund. He immediately began collecting money for the storm's victims at his concerts in September of 2005. Aaron, one thing I've noticed here is all the bracelets. Can you tell us about these? You know, um, first of all, this one was, uh, was given to me by a fan after 9-11. He made it. Uh, these other bracelets are KIA in this war on terror. And um, two of these were given to me by the mothers of these, these men. And uh, this one was a young Marine who was killed. But you know something, I wear them for the particular reason. I, I really appreciate it when people ask me about them because it gives me the opportunity to remind them that people do give the ultimate sacrifice. As far as what happened with me, I joined the Army in 1966, pretty much right out of high school. Uh, went to Germany for a year, went to Vietnam with the uh, 196 Light Infantry. Spent about 10 and a half months in country. Stepped on a landmine on January 11th, 1969. Uh, traumatic amputation of both my legs and my arm as a result of the explosion. I mean, that's how powerful the landmine was. Estimated about 25 pounds of TNT. So uh, three days at the 95th VAC in Da Nang, uh, five weeks at 106 General Hospital in Yokohama, Japan, and nine more months in the hospital at Fitzsimmons in Aurora, Colorado. So I had uh, a lot of rehabilitation, a lot of growing into becoming, you know, living with my new body and, and results of the injury that, that happened to me. And then, of course, the DAV, I mean, is a lifetime story from that point on. Been with them for, since joined them in 1970. Um, chapter commander, worked all the way up to officers in the Department of Florida, and became national commander of the organization in 2004, 2005, and just a, when they call, I just come running. I'm happy to help them in any way I can. That's what brought me here today. Eighty men took part in the Doolittle Raid on Japan, which was memorialized in the book and movie 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. As of this writing, only eight are still alive. In order to fully appreciate the significance of the Doolittle Raid, it is necessary to understand how the war effort was going at the time and the enormity of the risk the raiders took. The Doolittle Raid was so important because it was the first offensive action of our forces against the enemy. We were in this world war and our, our allies in Russia were being driven back at this time towards their principal cities of Stalingrad and Leningrad and Moscow. In North Africa, the British were being driven back by Rommel and his German forces back toward Cairo. Things were looking bad there. In the Pacific, after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, they went from one victory to another. They took over places like Guam, and, uh, and they went down into the, uh, uh, into the Philippines and put a large army in the Philippines and were in the process of defeating our forces there. That was the springtime of 42. Dick Cole was Jimmy Doolittle's co-pilot and took off in plane number one. Tom Griffin was the navigator on plane number nine. In the middle of uh, January, or about the third week in January, our group got orders to fly to South Carolina. In other words, they were picking us up off of our 
work out off the coast of Washington and Oregon looking for what never came. And we flew to uh, South Carolina. And when we got there, they said they were planning a very unusual, dangerous raid. And they wanted to warn us that it was going to be a dangerous raid. And they wanted uh, volunteers, knowing that uh, it was going to And the whole group volunteered. And everybody stepped forward, so they sent 20 crews of us down to Eglin Field, Florida. And uh, when we got down there, Jimmy Doolittle showed up. Now, he was a famous aviator even then. He was a lieutenant colonel. He'd been on, on the staff of the head of the Air Force in Washington. And he came down to train us for this mission. And uh, the main thing he emphasized right from the beginning was security. Do not tell anybody, including your family, what we're planning on doing. As a matter of fact, most of our fellas knew only that we were going to take off a carrier somewhere and go in the Pacific. That's one of the things that uh, I think people should remember about Colonel Doolittle. He actually assumed command of the mission on the 17th of January. You know, they had already pre-selected the launch date of 19 April. And during that time, he had to plan the mission, get the troops, get the airplanes, get the supplies, get them trained, and so forth to, to meet that 19th of April deadline, which he did in a couple of days less than the 90 days. Uh, in addition to that, he flew the mission. It just happened that I got a, 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 a bit of a break, I guess you'd say. Another fellow named Davy Jones and I, in early February, were sent up to Washington, D.C. to work with Air Force Intelligence. Now, we worked with two men there. They changed the lock on the door, and they were told to just cooperate with us, get what we were asking for, and don't ask any questions. So we spent about 10 days getting all the maps and charts of Japan and China that 20 crews were going to need, and we had to know the exact location of potential military and industrial targets that we might use so we could uh, know just where to send our boys. We got that all crated up, flew back down to Eglin Field, and took that with us to the carrier where we, we passed it out, of course, later. And on the uh, first day of uh, April, we went over and landed on an airstrip in San Francisco. And this airstrip was right next to the new carrier, the Hornet, that had just gotten in the day before. Colonel Doolittle landed the first plane. And when uh, he got out of his plane, they said, we can only accommodate 16 of your 20 planes. You're going to have to eliminate four planes and four crews. And um, it was interesting how he did that. As each pilot uh, taxied his, his plane up to where Doolittle was standing, uh, the boss would shout up to the pilot, is everything OK with your plane? And not knowing what an important question this was, if the man says, well, my left engine is a little rough, that's all it took. And that's how they eliminated four planes. When we first got on the carrier in uh, San Francisco Bay, we were very tight-lipped. We had been told, of course, don't tell anybody anything. Now here we were getting on this nice brand new carrier and these Navy boys were naturally very curious. They wanted to know what this was all about and where we were going. And we, of course, wouldn't tell them. We had strict orders not to tell them. And they were very unhappy with us. We learned that our destination was Tokyo, two days out to sea from the ship's PA system. Uh, at that time, there was a lot of jubilation and uh, uh, some of the Navy people uh, that uh, were happy with uh, Army airplanes being on their domain uh, became teammates and uh, uh, a lot of jubilation. After 
reality settled in, uh, I guess a lot of people wondered, uh, hey, what am I doing here? The 18th day that we were at sea, early in the morning, our task force went between two Japanese picket ships 650 miles out. Now, our intelligence did not know that they had these ships. Actually, they were fishing vessels equipped with radios to report just the sort of thing they saw that morning. Two carriers and four cruisers heading for Japan. And before they were sunk, our people realized that they had been able to radio into the main islands of Japan that this task force was heading for them. Uh, of course, they were then sunk by our people. So uh, it, we were 650 miles out, and uh, Admiral Halsey sent word over that the Doolittle Raiders were to take off immediately. Now, instead of getting to the point 400 miles, we had 250 more miles to fly. And when we took off, the best calculations we could make on how far we could go was that we would run out of fuel someplace over the China Sea, 150 to 200 miles short of Japan. You can imagine being on the deck of the Hornet. You're spotted 300 miles from where you go. You don't have enough gas to get there already. Doolittle says, guys, you can walk away. There's no blemish on your record. Not only did nobody walk away, but the reserve crews were trying to buy their way on, knowing that when they took off, they were going to be arriving over China in a storm in the middle of the night, and if they even got there, because they didn't have enough gas to get there, and they knew they didn't have enough gas to get there. And they still lined up and volunteered to go. That kind of commitment to me is, is just awesome. It's, it's, hard to, it's, it's hard for a lot of young people today to understand that, but it's important that, that we try to tell that story. Absolutely. We would not be here today if it weren't for those sacrifice those people. Yep. had 400 feet to take off. And one reason that they did that was because our right wing tip just missed the island by about six feet. And our left wheel then was about six feet from the edge of the carrier deck. So if we veered to the right or left in a longer takeoff run, we might uh, hit the right wing or the, le or the left wheel overboard. So we all took off from the same place. And we all got airborne as, as planned. And uh, it, was, it was a little uh, exciting at first, but plane number nine that I was on, by the time it was our turn, we were feeling pretty brave about the whole thing. Eight planes had successfully negotiated the takeoff ahead of us. Now, each plane went in on its own. It took, takes gas and, and time to, uh, to form in formation. So each plane was on its own. So we were about four or five minutes apart, which meant that in most cases, we never saw another B-25. So uh, we uh, headed in on the deck, 10 or 15 feet off the water, so their radar could not pick us up. And when we got over the city of Tokyo itself, we went in at rooftop level till we got to what we call our initial point where we pulled up to 1,500 feet to make our bombing run on our assigned target. Plane number nine happened to just fly right over Hirohito's house at about 50 feet. And uh, then we proceeded down to the uh, northern section of uh, Tokyo Bay and headed across to bomb our target which was a factory in the Kawasaki district of Tokyo making uh, tanks. We really flattened that target. 
Well, we found out about three years after the war ended in the Japanese archives, it told exactly where each one of our 16 planes went and what we had bombed. And plane number nine didn't hit that assigned target. We hit its immediate neighbor, the Tokyo Gas and Electric Company, and flattened it. So it wasn't a bad exchange. The 16B-25s of the Doolittle Raid left Japanese airspace virtually unimpeded by either Japanese aircraft or ground fire. One airplane had excessive fuel consumption and diverted to the Soviet maritime region. Its five crew members were interned by the then neutral Soviets. Four airplanes crash landed or ditched offshore. The 11 remaining crews took to their parachutes. Three men were killed that day. The Japanese captured eight crewmen. Three were executed in October of 1942, another died in prison a year later. The remaining Doolittle Raiders, including Tom Griffin and Dick Cole, returned to duty with the armed forces. Twelve of those lost their lives later in the war. Twenty-three of Doolittle's men received the Distinguished Flying Cross. The Raiders have met every year since to commemorate the raid. When we get together, it seems like uh, the raid was yesterday. It's great to see the ones that are still living and uh, we pay homage to the ones that have passed on. The mysteriousness of the thing, uh, the way it was designed was that uh, in this case that holds the goblets, there was a bottle of uh, Corvassier that was laid down the same year when Doolittle was born. As the story goes, at the end of the trail, there will be two raiders sitting together uh, with their goblet and uh, some of their covassier in the, in the cup. And uh, that will be the end of the Doolittle Raiders. I majored in political science, minored in economics and English, and I was going to use that four years as the uh, stepping stone to law. I was going to go to law school. World War II came along, and those plans went down the drain. After surviving the Doolittle Raid, Tom Griffin was reassigned to B-26 duty in Europe. I was assigned down to Harding Field, Louisiana, in a B-26 Marauder Group. Uh, and that was about the middle of July. We trained there until the 1st of October, went across the northern route to England. Though surviving the Doolittle Raid would seem like adventure enough for any one lifetime, Tom Griffin would find himself fighting for survival again in January of 1943 when his B-26 was shot down over the Mediterranean. So we were heading for Bone and our one good engine quit. And we had the, the uh, hatch open uh, above us so that when we hit the water, uh, the, the plane, the B-26, has the big heavy engines in front, and the plane went right under. And the last thing I remember, a wall of water was coming at me, and, and it drove me back against a bulkhead. And I was temporarily unconscious for a short time, but the rush of water picked me up and I went up through that hatch, open hatchway. And when I surfaced, I looked around and there were four other heads, so everybody had gotten out. It took us an hour and a half to get to shore. And when we got to shore, there were uh, uh, quite a number of Arab men 
in their white robes along the beach, along the stones there, and they were able to drag us up on those stones. Unfortunately for Tom, it was not over yet. On July 4th, we were in a bombing mission against the Germans in uh, Sicily. We were the lead plane of about 40 B-26s, and they knocked us down, and uh, we were captured. Our whole crew was captured. And of course, uh, from that time on, we gradually were sent up to uh, Germany, Stalag Luft III, and we spent the rest of the European war in a prison camp there, uh, 22 months of it. I was proud because that I was able to uh, get into the combat, make a contribution to it, and uh, continue until the time I was finally incarcerated by the enemy. But uh, I, I was able to be in with some other men and we made some ver very fine raids against our common foe over there. And I was proud of that. Today, Tom Griffin lives alone quietly in Cincinnati, Ohio. It is a true honor. We, we work with the disabled American veterans and represent the DAV's aviation outreach program. And I have to say, it is the greatest honor as an aviator that I've ever had was when we put together this package with the DAV. And now, you know, we're getting ready to take the airplane all the way down to New Orleans and do something really unique down with the, uh, with the convention, with the DAV convention and with the city of New Orleans. Not only is the DAV and, you know, and the veterans fighting back from their injuries, you know, today in Afghanistan and Iraq, you know, going back World War II, Korea, et cetera, but the city of New Orleans is also fighting back from you know, the disaster with Katrina. And what a wonderful group. Well, now it's time to take this baby to New Orleans. I'm ready to go. Let's go, buddy. All right, Street talking and damn proud of what I have accomplished. Some folks appreciate that, some don't. But I got it, honey. Now when I die, may I leave my kids a fortune. Hey, look at him. Hey, Gary Weaver. Hey, Gary, how you doing, On sir? On behalf of the Disabled American Veterans, welcome to New Orleans. Uh, you got to thank Larry for getting hey, me here. Gary. Larry, good to yeah. see you again. Great trip down. Long trip, but it's a great trip. Awful hot. It is no small task to put a World War II bomber in downtown New Orleans. Once the idea was introduced to the city by the DAV, it became clear that help would be required from many quarters. A derrick large enough to carry the airplane upriver would be needed. The New Orleans Port Authority would have to give its blessing. A push boat would be necessary to power the vessel carrying Panchito. New Orleans businessman David Schulingkamp became intrigued with the project. A former Army Judge Advocate General Officer, Schulingkamp is Vice President of the Customs Brokerage Firm M.G. Marr & Company and president of its Barge Logistics subsidiaries BargeLink LLC and MBLX Incorporated. When the DAV asked if I would assist 
uh, in the convention in a small way by arranging to move their B-25 bomber uh, or that of uh, one of its uh, very good, generous contributors from the Lakefront Airport to the foot of Canal Street. It was a real pleasure. For overall logistical support, coordination with the Port Authority and a derrick big enough to lift and transport Panchito, Shuling Camp turned to Ports America. Okay, Keith, now Ports America had a big job in getting this airplane to where it's sitting right now. So the first time you heard about this project was when? It's several months ago. Uh, we got contacted by Mr. Schulenkamp, uh, told us about the project, and really told us what it was all about. And really got the uh, momentum going with, with the port authorities, um, the tugboats. There was so many people involved, and him spearheading the whole project kind of made our job easy. Well, I could, and, and I got to say, some of the, some of the details that, that you had to work out, I mean, this, this is unusual, I'm sure. I know you guys haul a lot of freight and, and drop it on decks all over the place, but man, this is, this is precious cargo. Oh, it is, and it's, it it's, we've handled a lot of different uh, items over the years, and planes and boats and different type of uh, machinery, but uh, I think this is probably the most exciting uh, piece that we got to handle. The best part of the whole story, I was very excited to, to ride on the plane and we, we got to get on the plane, but it was the best part of it, we had um, Vernon, and I don't know the gentleman's uh, last name, he was an 87-year-old veteran I saw him out here. that he rode in a plane with us, and, and out of everything, that was pretty good, pretty good. It really was, pretty touching. The push boat needed to power Keith's Derrick upriver was provided by American Commercial Lines. American Commercial Lines is an integrated uh, marine transportation uh, provider. Uh, we uh, operate uh, towboats and barges all over the inland uh, waterways of the United States, hauling uh, sorts of cargoes from uh, dry cargoes and liquids. We also manufacture barges and towboats. White is the son of a World War II veteran and he had the opportunity to take a short flight on Panchito before the airplane was transported upriver. My father was a, a veteran and, and, uh, of World War II and, and to hear stories and then actually to go up in the plane and experience the, the living conditions, the, the cramped quarters and realizing there wasn't a whole lot of protection for those guys uh, in addition to cramped space, heat, cold. Uh, took a lot of intestinal fortitude to be able to go up there day in and day out and execute their missions a lot of respect for those guys. Tremendous amount of respect. Johnny Cephalou was the point of contact for the New Orleans Port Authority. Well, I think it's a wonderful opportunity uh, to have the disabled veterans uh, aircraft here. Um, it helps uh, overall and it shows the port that we're alive and well. Um, it, it, that uh, the port is uh, here and, and, and we're here to service not only cargo interests, uh, the, not only the cruise lines, but also for these, these special type events. Sixty-five years after B-25s were landed dockside near San Francisco to be loaded for a seagoing journey into immortality, Anchito was flown from a Wisconsin air show to an airport north of New Orleans on Lake Pontchartrain. The plan is to lift her over the seawall at Lakefront Executive Airport, place her on a derrick, push her up the industrial canal, through a set of locks, then take her upriver to be offloaded at the Canal Street Wharf, just a few yards from the DAV Convention Hotel. It's a delicate operation, not only because the airplane is extremely rare, out of the 10,000 plus that were built, less than 35 remain, but simply because this has not been done before, at least not in the last 65 years or so. It's a labor of love for all involved, including Aaron Tippin. It's pretty amazing.
I'm nervous, I tell you that. That shines seems bleak to you. No hotels or motels for me anymore. It looks yeah, there you go. I mean, how do you feel about it? I mean, we're, we're, it's we're, describe, we're there. It's hard to describe <laughs> my feelings. It's, <laughs> right it, it's happening to all of us, and it's, it's magic time. I, I think that's the best way I could put it because. It's one thing to conceive of an idea, it's quite another to, to put it all together and to make it a reality. It's just like you and your music. You get an idea and a concept in your head and it stays in there and pretty soon it works itself out into, into music that's harmonious and you create it out of nothing. And it feels good when you do it. Well, I can tell you, buddy, you dreamed up a good one, so why don't you go take a nap and dream up something else like this again? <laughs> I think these things come along once in a lifetime, maybe. But uh, hey, we're we're picking up speed. I think I'm gonna get the skis out and ski a little bit. <laughs> maybe I'll join you. <laughs> Mike McCabe of Air Support LLC manages the air show outreach program of the Disabled American Veterans. He was charged with arranging the New Orleans logistics. Okay, Mike McCabe. You know that's a pretty famous name in the air show business, buddy. But this has got to be one of the wildest things you've ever been a part of. Well, it is. When we started this program almost five years ago, I never dreamed we'd end up here on the river. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Well, you were here for the whole thing today and helping out and getting this bird on here. You know, and somebody else I got to know is, how, what about your hookup with the DAV? How did you get, in, get involved with those guys? Well, it started, as I said, about five years ago. Uh, we had an initial contact from DAV wanting to explore what air shows were all about. And uh, we began uh, researching uh, with DAV. Uh, what the opportunities might be. We ended up uh, doing a test air show and uh, found a real great response from the public and out of that it has grown the AV Aviation Outreach Program. For some, an icon. For all, a symbol. Hard work pays off the way it should. And when company comes to New Orleans, there's only one thing to do, throw a party. Where the stars and stripes and the eagle fly. Like respectful grandchildren, Air Force F-15 Strike Eagles thundered over Panchito's party in tribute to an elderly ancestor to whom much is owed. There are those who have said that the principal value of the Doolittle Raid of April 1942 was psychological. That after the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, we were beleaguered and beaten down by retreat after retreat until those 80 brave men, led by Jimmy Doolittle, against all odds, delivered a message to the enemy right downtown. Others maintain that the raid had significant logistical importance, which turned the tide of the war in the Pacific. Sixty-five years later, looking at a Mitchell B-25, sitting silently in the golden afternoon sun 
on the banks of North America's mightiest river, in a city that has been beleaguered and beaten down by one of the most catastrophic natural disasters in recorded history, it is hard to determine which benefit, the psychological or the strategic, is more important. Because this old warrior's waterborne reprise reminds us that, in the events of history, as in the lives of men and women, it is the will to fight back, no matter the odds, that ultimately wins the day. <laughs>